Is my mic on? Yeah. Um, Okay, um, sorry for the delay. A little, um, we had another meeting in the room. Hi, my name is Scott Kisner. I'm the superintendent of Stafford County Public Schools. I want to welcome and uh, everyone to our fourth town hall meeting. Um, tonight we are going to focus on virtual learning, our uh, plan for virtual instruction. Um, regardless of what plan is adopted, virtual instruction is a big part of the uh, Stafford County Public School instructional delivery model um, for the upcoming school year. Um, what we do know that um, depending on uh, the plan that's adopted and the um, uh, governor's um, phases that, that um, students learning online um, is going to be a part of not only Stafford County Public Schools uh, instructional plan, but all other school systems. So tonight, um, if you've been watching our town hall meetings, you might realize that I am not sitting up on a dais. I am, I am at a place where people usually talk to me. Uh, but tonight we are very fortunate. We are joined by uh, four uh, very important members of our instructional leadership team one member will be joining us uh, in a few minutes. He's finishing up another meeting. So um, on my right, I want to uh, welcome Dr. Jan Strike. Uh, Dr. Jan is the, uh, Dr. Strike is the executive director of our learning um, and organizational de development. I'd like to um, recognize Ms. Carrie Neely. She oversees our elementary education programs and Dr. Andy Greider who oversees our middle school instructional programs, and Dr. Tom Nichols, who will be joining us soon, oversees our high school instructional programs. Also in the audience, we have Dr. George Hummer, who oversees our special education and student services program, uh, Colette Hanker, who oversees our health service programs, and um, uh, Jay Cook, who oversees our technology programs. So we are going to, uh, even though we're starting late, we will still dedicate 90 minutes uh, to this town hall meeting. And we want to thank, I want to thank everyone. We got received a lot of questions and we clustered the questions based on the questions that were asked the most. And we're going to get through um, as many as we can. And we also have um, a PowerPoint that I think is going to help um, the public to understand our uh, instructional direction. I would also just tell you that the spring, we learned a lot as a school system. I think every school system learned a lot. Um, I'm feeling much better, um, uh, great confidence in our leadership team. Uh, in uh, late July, I think you're going to see remarkable improvement uh, when we start school on August 31st, the week of August 31st. I think you're going to uh, recognize right away um, the difference of our spring. Um, I will just again encourage the public um, that uh, we're all learning. We're going to have uh, about 30,000 students learning virtually. That's uh, uh, an important task. We're going to have uh, 22, 2300 teachers delivering instruction virtually. So we're all learning. We're learning by doing, but we're learning by preparing and looking at the best practices. So um, we will start, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Andy Greider, who's going to facilitate tonight's town hall. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kisner. So this evening, we wanted to start by sharing some basic information about our back to school plan. We've had staff members that have been working all summer long and beyond that to get ready for our fall. And we're excited about some of the things that we're going to be bringing to you. So as you know, we've offered both a 100% virtual option as well as a hybrid option. Regardless of the option that parents and students choose, we believe that our students' experiences are going to be engaging and exciting. 
Our school board graciously provided our teachers an extended planning time before our school year began, which enabled them to start working on and building our learning management system. This learning management system is gonna be used with both our hybrid students and also our 100% virtual students. And we're really excited about the rollout of this learning management system. As a result, we're confident that our students are gonna have a positive learning experience this year. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Neely. Thank you, Dr. Greider. So we are gonna start this evening uh, sharing with you um, a, a glance at our hybrid model and our virtual model. And you might be wondering, well, why are we even sharing the hybrid model? But it's really important for us for you to understand that we have been giving special attention to the ability for your children to move in and out of either the hybrid model or a virtual model seamlessly, and our teachers as well. Um, and I would just uh, reach out to all of our parents out there and just say, and many of us are parents as well, and we appreciate what uh, difficult decisions you have to make. And I just wanna assure you that we are really planning with your child in mind. That's very important for us. And so when we share this presentation tonight, we've kind of looked at it through the eyes of a child. And we hope that will help you better understand what we have planned because as, Ms. as Dr. Greider said, we wanna welcome your children back to school. We want this to be a, an exciting event for them, whether they start virtually or whether they start in a hybrid model. We're gonna welcome them. We wanna build a sense of community because we know that's what makes Stafford special. So we're gonna get started with our 2020 fall learning experience. And so the first thing you might be wondering is what's a week look like? So there will be five days of learning for all of our students and that learning will occur in a one-stop shop for learning, which is the Canvas Learning um, Management System. We're really excited about this opportunity to work through Canvas, and as you'll see, uh, there are many factors that make this um, the right choice for our students, for our teachers in Stafford, so we're looking forward to sharing more and more as we learn more and more about the capability. Our school hours, early childhood would be 10 to 2.45. Elementary is going to be 9 to 2. We'll have two shifts. Um, and then there'll be an 8 to 1 o'clock shift. You'll see that provides five hours there. High school, 11 to 4.15. Middle school, 10 to 3 o'clock. <clears throat> and you're wondering who teaches. And one of the exciting pieces of our virtual proposal, obviously as well as our hybrid, is our Stafford County Public School teachers will be teaching your students. And we believe they are the most capable um, teachers that we could have. We wanna start through the eyes of a child. So we're gonna meet Felicity. She is an elementary school student and Felicity's parents have chosen for her, if hybrid is a, an option, to learn at school. So Felicity is gonna have teacher check-ins, obviously, with her and with small groups during her week. She'll start the day with a morning meeting. She'll have two days of learning at school. She'll have three days of learning that is aligned with the learning at school, but that learning will happen at home. Parents will have flexibility with that pacing. So if parents have a job uh, during the day and it's more convenient for Felicity to work in the afternoon, for example, they'll have that flexibility on those three days. Um, there'll be online practice, again, that is aligned with the learning that Felicity is doing in school, so it won't be separated. Teachers will have the opportunity to check in on Felicity's progress and give Felicity feedback. She'll be engaged in new learning. You're gonna find that this looks very different from the spring. Uh, we are starting on a new foot. We feel like it's an exciting start to a, a really challenging situation, um, but it's definitely going to look different in the fall than it did in the spring. And, and it, it won't be 100% uh, screen time online learning. That's one of the, um, 
the concerns that some parents have shared with me. I, I'm concerned that my child will have too much screen time in the virtual learning portion. And so you have to remember that these lessons are going to be designed by building level PLCs, by Felicity's grade level. Uh, Felicity is in first grade, so Felicity's first grade team is going to be designing her lesson. Felicity's first grade students, her, her peers, will be getting the same lesson across that grade level. Um, so by planning together, we know that our teachers are going to collaborate to come up with some um, essential aspects of learning, and our LOD folks are working with us to help plan that uh, to ensure that Felicity's learning experience is um, motivating, engaging, and involves those five C's and the W that we know are very important. So something, uh, uh, Felicity happens to have to move to virtual. That may happen first, right? Because we may make, the board may make a decision for us to come back to school virtual as some of our neighboring um, divisions have. And I'm just gonna look at my notes because I'm having trouble seeing the screen there. So Felicity is going to, if she learns virtually, you're going to notice a lot of similarities. Um, Felicity is going to learn from home five days a week. The major difference here is she's going to be learning from home. She's going to have two days of learning in real time with a face-to-face -face virtual teacher, a teacher from her school, Stafford County Public School uh, teacher. She'll have be engaged in new learning and, again, uh, she won't have 100% screen time. We're going to add in our resources. Our LOD folks have already been working on manipulatives at the elementary level, I know. Uh, we have new workbooks that we have purchased through our new reading series, through our um, math series. So um, we've got writing. Um, there are lots of opportunities for students to participate and engage in learning that is teacher-directed, but it's not online per se or screen time learning and she'll be engaging in that with her peers and now we're going to meet Jaden and Jaden's parents have decided he's going to learn from home this summer or this uh, fall and Jaden again is going to learn from home five days a week two days of learning in real time or recorded instruction if Jaden is not um, able to access that in real time. We're working on some creative ways to make sure Jaden can access that learning. He'll have three days of learning at home with flexible pacing, just like Felicity did. So keep in mind that at home learning, whether you're hybrid or virtual, is basically going to be aligned with the learning um, that is either face to face virtual or face to face in person those two days a week. There'll be flexible pacing with due dates, online practice, um, and again, Jaden will be engaged in new learning. So it sounds very familiar, um, and that is intentional. That's one of the exciting things that we feel like our new plan provides, and that is the alignment of the hybrid model and the virtual so that students can seamlessly move in and out of uh, whichever model we happen to have to be in. And a little note at the bottom, uh, Jaden's little sister in early childhood would also receive developmentally appropriate instruction in one of these models as well. And so with that, we're going to move to a look at middle school. Thank you, Ms. Neely. So for the middle school perspective, basically the same structure as the elementary school perspective. Two days of learning at school with the hybrid model and three days of learning at home. We're looking at each student taking four courses a day and so we're asking students to spend approximately one hour per course per day, whether that's in direct instruction with the teacher on one of those two days or uh, three days learning at home. We will expect our students to be engaged in new learning. We will have flexible pacing with due dates. And we do expect our teachers to check in with students during the week when they're not in school. If, as Ms. Neely talked about, 
we have to all go into a virtual model. Our hybrid students will follow the same schedule. And the purpose for that is so that we can have a seamless transition from in-person to virtual education. Again, the student will learn from home five days a week, one hour per day per course is the same. Flexible pacing with due dates. We will have online practice and perhaps real, not perhaps real, definitely real, but perhaps recorded uh, instruction and certainly engaged in new learning and as Ms. Neely mentioned, not 100% on screen learning. For the middle school, 100% virtual model, again, it's going to look very similar. Student learns from home five days a week. One hour per course is, again, what we're asking for. Same number of courses that the students are going to take, whether it's 100% virtual or whether it's the hybrid model. Students will have flexible pacing with due dates, online practice, of course, real-time or recorded instruction, and definitely engaged in new learning. Again, not 100% on-screen learning. Dr. Greider, do you want to share the high school? I can talk a little bit about the high school, yes. So for, for the most part, students will take four courses per day. And again, two days of learning with the hybrid model and three days at home. So you'll note that elementary, middle, and high are all the same in terms of two days of learning at school and three days of learning at home. Like the middle school, the high school is one hour per course. Students will be engaged in new learning, flexible pacing, and again, like the middle school, the high school's teachers are going to be asked to ensure that they do check in with students on those three days that they're not in school. So the high school and middle school models are very similar. Now, if we go into a full virtual model, again, four courses per day that does not change for high school, five days a week at home, approximately one hour per course per day, flexible pacing, and et cetera. So it's very similar. And then, of course, 100% virtual, our high school students will learn from home five days a week. Again, one hour per course per day, flexible pacing, online practice, et cetera. Very, very similar to the middle school model. So our, you know, we see many benefits to this model and we've thought about it pretty extensively. We've worked with uh, many of our stakeholders, parents, teachers. Uh, we've had opportunity to get feedback from lots of different uh, stakeholders. And some of the benefits that we feel confident about moving into this model is we maintain a schedule no matter what happens, uh, whether we have to move back into a virtual or whether we can uh, experience more face-to-face. -face. And we're going to talk about this in a bit, but you, we can't wait for your children to be back with us face-to-face. -face. That is, I think Dr. Kisner mentioned that um, last night. We all long for that moment. So. Um, you know, this is really challenging for all of us, but we will get there, and uh, we're going to be ready for your students. We're going to be ready to welcome them back when they're face-to-face, -face, but we're also going to be ready to welcome them virtually. Um, it does maintain a sense of community, so whether your child is virtual or whether your child is in the hybrid model at, for example, Rocky Run, you're still going to be part of that Rocky Run community. You're still going to you know be a part of that family and when we do all merge together our students are going to be familiar with that community um, and feel um, like they've been a part of the community all along students can seamlessly obviously transition from one to the other and um, we also maintain the same pacing uh, to keep students um, you know, aligned um, whether we go in virtual or hybrid model. And we think that's really important for students, for our curriculum. Again, our LOD folks have worked with us to develop some essential standards that our teachers are going to be using to plan by. Um, and I would also add that our PLCs, our teams, our grade level teams working together are a really critical part of this work. 
so I got a little ahead of myself. Uh, teachers working collaboratively in those PLC teams. And just, you know, this has been the work of the last several years in Stafford. Uh, we're continuing to grow in this area. And many of our teachers noted um, how much that meant to them in the time um, when they were not able to come into school. That planning with colleagues is, is just essential. Um, teachers own their students. They get to know their students and build that sense of community. Um, again, for example, in the morning meeting for elementary, we hope to have both virtual and students who are uh, in the hybrid model or face-to-face -face a part of those morning meetings. Um, teachers design the learning experience, and as again, we know they're the most capable in that area because they know their students. And no matter where they learn, every student has the same curriculum, again, and the same pacing. And we've worked diligently the past several years. Our LOD folks um, have really um, put so much work into this, aligning with new <coughs> resources that are fabulous and, and right on time, by the way, um, Dr. Strike, I might add, because I know we have a lot of online resources now with uh, many of the new resources that we have purchased recently. And so with that, I'm going to turn things back over to Dr. Greider, who's going to guide us through some questions that we know you all are interested in having answers to. All right. Thank you, Ms. Neely. And just to reiterate, we had a number of questions sent in, all very good questions. And so we hope that this will be very informative for our parents, our students, and our community members. So Ms. Neely, how about we start with you? Sure. So what will hybrid with remote learning experience actually look like? So one of the reasons we wanted to start um, through the eyes of a student tonight and kind of take you through that is we know that you all are processing this at home. So hopefully our presentation uh, tonight gave you a better idea of what it might feel like to be part of that hybrid model or the virtual model uh, in the eyes of a student, whether that's elementary, middle, or high school. Um, I would encourage you, certainly, you know, we are here to answer any questions. I've had the privilege of talking and learning from um, several uh, parents who have given a call. You know that your building level administrators are also there if you have questions about what it's going to look like for your child's school. I know Dr. Kisner mentioned last night that uh, we would like to pursue having a town hall meeting for all of our schools so you can look forward to that in the future as well but you know if you have questions after hearing tonight's presentation we hope that you'll reach back out to us um, so that we can help clarify and, and we learn from you and your questions in all honesty so the next question I'll answer is related to start and end times and I think one of the things that's important to remember when we were developing the, the hybrid schedule, we were working very closely with transportation. As you know, there are some limitations in terms of the number of students that can ride a school bus. And so we had to work within the constraints of our wonderful transportation department uh, to modify our times so that we could make sure that, that we maximize the amount of time that students were at school. One of the things that we felt was very important was that whether students were in the hybrid uh, model or 100% virtual that students would have the same schedule so they could move seamlessly from one to the other and so with our start times early childhood uh, is from 10 to 2 elementary has two different schedules the first schedule is 8 to 1 and the second schedule is 9 to do to 2 excuse me middle school is 10 to 3 and high school 11 to 415 and so along with the uh, start times and end times, uh, parents wanted to know how many hours are actually uh, involved in in-classroom instruction. And that's going to vary a little bit based on the level. Uh, as we mentioned, with middle and high school, it's going to be four hours, and with elementary school, approximately three. So the next question is related to interactive virtual video classes to supplement the in-classroom instruction at all levels. Um, and currently, um, we're developing training for staff, students, and parents so that we can use a multifaceted approach um, regarding instructional resources 
uh, to include interactive videos. Let me scroll to the next question, pardon me. Okay, will you work with families on virtual hours? For example, can my student complete his or her virtual learn learning when I am home in the evening? Ms. Neely, you wanna take that one? Sure, so um, we spoke earlier about the days, the three days when students are learning at home, um, online and, and offline doing some uh, learning that parents will have great flexibility on those days and again if it works better for your schedule to have uh, Felicity work um, in the afternoons or evenings because you want to be there to monitor that uh, those three days you have great flexibility we hope uh, we'd like to work with our daycare centers um, and and really try when at all possible for Felicity if she goes virtual or Jaden, who is starting virtual. Um, we really hope that they can connect with a teacher because there is something about um, being able to connect live with that teacher in a virtual experience and live with your classmates. But we realize that might not be possible in all situations. So absolutely, we're gonna work with you um, to really kind of problem solve and um, your school principals are gonna be the, your, your you know your sounding board if you're having difficulty making that work um, your child's teacher um, will be available to work with you to come up with solutions um, and also the canvas platform does allow some features that will uh, we feel like provide a good um, safety netting for us to use if your child can't be there face-to-face -face, virtually uh, then we will definitely work with you to create a plan that works for you and your family Okay, so Ms. Neely, if uh, students are ill or if they're out of town, uh, can students attend virtually on a regular schedule? And I would say when possible, absolutely. And I tried thinking of a scenario where this might not work, and I, um, I was having trouble coming up with one that, that made 100% sense. Um, you know, the first scenario I thought is, well, what if you were out of town and uh, the virtual class happened on a Friday it would be difficult to repeat that but just as we talked about um, the student before who um, might not be able to attend that session live we'll have to have some alternatives in canvas for those lessons for any family who um, had a reason that uh, they couldn't attend face to face that day so that's kind of an area that we're going to need to explore um, but certainly we have to figure that piece out, got to figure out how to work um, so that we don't leave your child behind because we know that it's, you know, it's going to be challenging for every family to make even the synchronous learning days work sometimes in a virtual setting. Thank you. Ah, this next question, this is, this is a really good question. Will the curriculum given be the same as a normal school year? Uh, it's an off, often asked question. Dr. Strike, would you be able to help us with that one? Yeah, um, yes, I can tell you that the curriculum is based on the Virginia Department of Education frameworks and uh, their skill and their standards. Uh, the most important piece about our models that we've been developing, and it, it's just not, I know Carrie mentioned LAUD. LAUD is Learning and Organizational Development. But I want to emphasize that our teachers have been working with LAUD facilitators all summer um, since we knew that we were in the middle of a pandemic. So I have to credit and I have to uh, acknowledge the fact that there has, there has been a small army of teacher leaders supporting the effort to identify power standards, which we call essentials. And Carrie mentioned that a little earlier. Those essentials, um, the easiest way to explain an essential would be to say these are the big ideas, the big concepts, and rather than going a mile wide and an inch deep, we're going very deep on these important essential standards in the face-to-face -face instruction, so in-depth instruction so we can target student-focused learning. And we're prioritizing that aspect in the face-to-face so that we can actually use the non-essentials 
or the smaller, less prioritized standards during our at-home learning or virtual side of our experiences. So um, that's happening at every grade level and for every course all through the summer. So we've been doing a lot of work behind the scenes with that. So Dr. Strike, uh, another question that, that's been frequently asked. So we had, we had some time out of school in the spring. How are you planning to get children caught up academically after they've been out of school for so long? This is a, um, obviously an international conversation. Uh, how, how do you do that? You do that by um, making sure that your teachers are working in teams with one another with the guidance of good school leaders and focused on data. That data collected comes from pre-assessments. Uh, we have been in previous years and when we come to the board with requests we use universal screeners. Um, those screeners can be for the most part delivered remotely or virtually. Um, However, we can come up with other types of assessments uh, that we can do. And once we have those screeners, that gives us a baseline of where our students are. And the professional learning community, uh, Carrie mentioned PLCs. The PLC takes that data and designs, using those essential standards, uh, a customized approach with interventions and supports for those students. So. Uh, that's the approach. That's what we've been working on for quite a long time. And I know there's been a lot of professional learning to support uh, how you identify essentials and how you identify your tiers for those interventions uh, across all of our grade levels. And, and so how do you synchronize those virtual classes with the in-person curriculum to ensure that course objectives are met? Uh, Part of our design in the schedule for the coordination uh, when our board uh, gave us the, the additional three weeks for professional learning, we were able to design a schedule that allowed those PLCs to meet. And in fact, it is our goal that our hybrid teachers and our virtual, our teachers that will be teaching virtually, um, actually work together in their PLCs on Monday so that we have very close, um, closely paced uh, uh, curriculum and instructional planning together so that we can keep that in sync. Uh, and I, I really believe that our teachers and our teacher leaders and our PLC facilitators can make that happen. All right. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Neely, will parents have access to find out what assignments are and when they are due? So I think this is something that parents are very much going to appreciate about um, the selection of using Canvas for an LMS. It's one of the things that makes the learning experience in the fall very, very different from the learning experience you had in the spring. Um, but in the Canvas um, learning management tool, we have um, to-do lists, we have message boards, we have calendars, so there are a lot of tools that are provided for students to, and teachers in all honesty, um, to stay organized in terms of their work, so, um, and parents. Um, so I, I think you're going to find that it's an excellent tool for help keeping your family organized, because we know that can be a challenge right now. Um, to, to stay on top of everything. Um, so that's something we're looking forward to. So the next question is about school supplies. And I know at the middle and high school, um, you know, we'll obviously post things on the website, but we'll also ask teachers to provide that information when we have an orientation period. And for elementary schools, in terms of school supplies? Yeah, so elementary schools have, have put some work into reviewing our supply list this year. Of course, masks are going to be um, a, a change for this year that we're going to ask uh, parents to send in for your child. Um, but one of the other things we're really in tune with is that, uh, one, the kinds of materials that we use might be slightly different because we know that um, we're going to ask mostly that your child bring in the things that your child is going to use. They're not going to be the bulk community um, classroom kinds of um, 
school supplies that we maybe have seen in the past. So, and the other piece is we've really tried to be mindful of the financial hardships of many of our families, and we've really uh, tried to keep elementary supplies around a $25 um, dollar mark. And also, we know that we have many organizations, and, and we can't express enough thanks to our community who have reached out um, to ask us, how can we support, you know, how can we donate, we're here for you. Um, so it, certainly, if you have any issues with providing supplies for your child, reach out, uh, let your teacher know, and we will make sure that your child gets the supplies that they need. Great. Um, let's see. Okay, the next question is pretty simple. Who controls the virtual classroom? And that will be the classroom teacher. So um, that's pretty cut and dry. Um, Ms. Neely, uh, where will students access their online curriculum? So I'm still learning about Canvas too, but my understanding is there will be a waffle selection when they log into their Chromebook. They will um, have a Canvas icon and they'll just, it'll be very seamless. They'll just click on their, um, their connection um, on the Google Waffle, and students are already accustomed to doing this for Google Classroom, so that should be one of the easier parts is how to get on for students to learn. So Dr. Nichols, if you could help us with the next question, will there be interac interactive instructor-led classes like virtual video classes? Dr. Greger, yes, uh, that's probably one of the most exciting things with Canvas, that we're able to put a lot of different resources into one landing page for our students. So our, we will have teachers who will provide um, live instruction, but we'll also have uh, recorded instruction. We'll also have a lot of other activities that can be launched from our Canvas system. So it's one of the reasons we're so excited about moving forward with Canvas. And then our next question is about tests and quizzes. Dr. Strike, if you could help us out, how will tests and quizzes be given? Uh, well, there's lots of ways to measure students. And in a virtual environment and in our hybrid environment, we want to make sure we're thinking about three things. And that's the student engagement piece. How engaging are we as educators and how <coughs> engaged are the kids? Um, how are we monitoring their progress and their growth? and then, of course, achievement. So Canvas does have uh, a way to build in your assessments. Uh, however, I think a conversation with a student, we often get, well, how, wouldn't, how do you know it's their work? A conversation with a group of students will tell you where the students are on, on meeting the particular task or objective. But you certainly can do more traditional. And we can also focus on our performance assessments, which has been a, a big um, effort here in Stafford and also across the state. So uh, we will continue. Okay, thank you. A uh, lot of discussion about our learning management system, uh, which is called Canvas. And Dr. Nichols, you have a nice metaphor for that. Could you explain <laughs> that a little bit? Well, yes, I think the best way to explain Canvas is to look at our Canvas learning management system as a kitchen where you go into your kitchen, you prepare your great meals or your great lessons for your students. You also have access to the microwave, or what we might consider Google Classroom, where you can go in and enhance the food that you pull out of your refrigerator and cook it so that you can uh, provide a great instructional lesson again. We also have, if you take, um, we've heard conversations earlier on about Edgenuity and Virtual Virginia. Well, we can take content, um, content from other areas and have it in our, in our kitchen, which is sort of like fast food. We can pull that in to enhance our lessons. So we're really excited again about Canvas and the platform. It's a launching pad, one place that we can go and provide all the instruction. And if I can just uh, piggyback on that a little bit, because I, I'm sure that we have parents out there who are wondering for our K-2 students, for example, this sounds a little too much like a college online course. Um, one of the things I can tell you is um, principals have had a ch elementary principals recently had a chance. Um, I've had a chance. Our instructional team had a chance to view a landing page, um, as it's called, in Canvas. And I think you're going to be very excited to see um, 
the way that learning is adapted for our youngest students. It's very engaging. We saw an avatar of their teacher. Um, it's interactive in terms of students can click different areas and it will further um, engage them and allow them to do a little self-exploring as well that will um, add to their engagement and learning. Very developmentally appropriate and I will tell you that our elementary principals are a hard sell in that area because um, they know our students and um, and they were very excited to see the potential there so I'm, I'm looking forward to parents being a part of that thank you dr. Hummer I was hoping that you might be able to help us with a few of our next few questions so the first one is can students choose to do 100% virtual throughout the entire year so as we navigate this pandemic, we're going to continuously assess the different options, the hybrid and the 100% virtual option. However, we want to make sure that we are limiting the number of interruptions for our students uh, plan um, as we move forward with um, uh, the different plans that are available to students, we want to make sure that this 100% virtual option is available regardless of what direction we go in after next week. I would also like to mention that um, there are stipulations in place to make sure that there is a limitation in regards to students going back and forth between a hybrid and a virtual option um, so we can, again, limit the number of interruptions for a student's platform. Okay, thank you. And so one of the concerns, obviously, with uh, paper and textbooks and things like that, so the next question is, will students who choose the 100% virtual option uh, be given textbooks? So the majority of curriculum materials uh, and textbooks are going to be made available. However, there also is going to be textbooks available digitally as well. Okay. And the next one is a little bit longer, uh, so please pardon me as I read. Yes, sir. How will the hybrid virtual model be implemented for students with disabilities who may not have the ability to wear a mask, whether due to sensory processing challenges, physical ailments, cognitive impairments or who may not be able to adhere to social distancing protocol for reasons such as requiring adult support for hand over hand assistance with assignments, elopement, behavioral concerns, etc. So we will take into consideration the unique needs of students when, re when they are required to wear a mask as well as to, to ear adhere to other health measures when they're in the building. So we are going to have to balance the disability of children as well as keeping everybody safe to including staff and other stakeholders that will be coming in and out of the classroom. There's also accommodations and other measures that we can make to make sure that students are accommodated if they do come into the building to make sure that they're adhering to those healthy measures as well as implementing the IEP as it is written. IEP teams can also make um, different determinations and decisions to make sure that we're doing what's best for the child as well as adhering to health measures as well as training our staff that is going to be working with those students to make sure that they have other options that are available to them such as um, additional PPE, cleanliness in the classroom, so on and so forth. So we're going to make sure that we navigate each of those scenarios. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Hummer. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. And so the next few questions relate to technology. Uh, so we'll ask our Executive Director of Technology, Mr. Jay Cook. Um, Mr. Cook, will additional Chromebooks be made available to those students who did not previously receive one and will all students receive a Chromebook? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Greider, every student will receive a Chromebook. Uh, we plan on checking those out from local schools, from the student school during the orientation week, right before school starts. Um, every student will get a Chromebook. And how do students reach out for help or support if they need further assistance with technology? Well, there's, there's two parts to that. Um, both are available or will be available in the Family Outreach Training Portal. That's on our website. Uh, for any kind of assistance, even outside of technology, they, they can find uh, contact information on, in multiple languages on how to get that assistance. And then for technology, there will be uh, an email address or a phone number that uh, they'll be able to contact uh, a technician and get help. Um, and, and how do students and parents obtain specific help with technology in Chromebooks? Yeah, like in the Family Outreach Center. It'll, it'll, that's a, we're going to make it a one-stop 
place for there'll be links in other places but that's going to be the place to go for for all of the assistance you might need okay thank you very much um, um, dr. strike if, if you wouldn't mind taking the next one uh, will the student have the same virtual teacher or will it always change will there also be other students in the same session if so how many um, so what, what our plan is is that we'll have a Stafford County teacher assigned to the virtual um, program so we want to make sure we keep that consistency for the student with that teacher uh, of course in the secondary there are going to be courses and teachers virtual teachers that are assigned to those students because we are working with our schedules and setting those schedules up there might be a situation where um, you might have two teachers or you might have one teacher working with part students in a uh, hybrid and then uh, part of, she might have a block where she's working with virtual and what I mean by two teachers that they might be doing something together in a class but we really want to make sure pre-k through 12 with the, we're keeping that consistency because we know community and identification with schools so that's a priority to start with matching teachers up in schools with the students that go to those schools if we can do that uh, the next question is related to attendance dr. strike if you could help us with that as well can parents expunge an absence if their internet service was interrupted um, we're awaiting uh, guidance from the Virginia Department of Education on attendance um, and I know that they are certainly defining it with a great deal of flexibility so I I believe that when when we um, actually look at attendance if there is a circumstance where they couldn't attend but they also made up that work that would be expunged so to speak okay and the next question is is clearly high school uh, Dr. Nichols, are students able to take DE, IB, STAT, CTE, CGS, and AP courses in both the hybrid and virtual models, and which courses? Dr. Grider, that's a great question and one I've heard over and over again over the last couple of weeks. Um, to answer that question, yes. Uh, students will be able to take AP, DE, IB, STAT, some CTE classes, in the Commonwealth Governor's School in our virtual and hybrid delivery options. Um, I will preface the CTE courses. There are some courses that require a lot of hands-on practical applications. Um, our, currently, our teachers are working and developing these courses. And it may be a, a course where kids are going to do some background information um, and then also try to come into the lab so they can get their, meet their hours so they can take their certification tests at the end of the course. And again, those courses are most likely going to be offered on our, in our hybrid program on the every other day or the year-long course schedule. But yes, they will be offered with the exception of some CTE courses that may not be fully developed yet or applicable to online learning. Right. Okay. Um, and here's a question that, that I've heard some parents ask. Uh, so, Dr. Strike, can we live stream the classroom and with emphasis on only focusing on the teacher? Um, is there tech technologically ca capability to do that from pre-K through 12 in Stafford County, just focused on the teacher? Um, that would be very difficult because if you were going to do it to make any kind of um, excitement and engagement for the student on the other side of that uh, that would require a great deal of um, technical equipment in every single classroom or scenario so we do we've invested in um, some cameras to do that for special circumstances but I want to emphasize that when our teachers are working on those essentials and those tasks and those really outstanding lessons that they're planning for the hybrid that oftentimes the focus is on the students and not necessarily on teacher directed instruction so um, you may see that and it may vary across the different levels etc but you won't see it all the time every time in terms of live streaming the way we think about that and that's how we 
Um, when I think of live streaming, I think of the robust interactive classrooms that you might see on YouTube or something like that. Um, you wouldn't be seeing that all the time everywhere in, in our hybrid or face-to-face -face kind of instruction that we have. And Dr. Nichols, back to you with a high school question. How many courses will high school students be required to take at one time? Well, one of the considerations that we dealt with was looking at how many courses a student would be taking um, when we come back to school, whether face-to-face -face or on a virtual uh, option. And we decided and worked with our high school principals that we're going to offer a four-by-four four hybrid schedule. And what that means is that the majority of your students will take four classes per semester. With the hybrid, we also have some year-long classes that go every other day, in which I talked about earlier as far as some AP courses, IB, DE courses, and some of our CTE courses that need to go year-long because of their end-of-the-year uh, certification tests. So majority of students will take four courses, but some students could take up to six courses during the semester. Oh, here's another question that, that we've heard uh, a fair bit. Um, which electives are offered 100% virtually, and which electives are offered in the hybrid mode? Dr. Strike, can you help us with that one? Uh, first, uh, Tom touched upon this in an earlier question, so I'm just going to piggyback on um, what, what he explained. Um, the reason they're, they're not the same is because uh, in many of our CTE electives, for example, we have state competencies that require demonstration. And that's really hard to do in a virtual setting. Um, and we also have equipment that you can't replicate in a virtual setting. So what we've attempted to do, uh, that's our teachers along with learning and organizational development and our facilitators is create a list and that list is available on the FAQ page that we are developing. I want to clarify um, and differentiate it. it is, it's a different FAQ page than the main page. It's under the proposed uh, return to school plan on the website. And you can, um, if you're interested, you can go and find the link for that on the FAQs. And we are, every day, working towards what can we do and moving in that direction of what can we provide in both the hybrid and in the virtual settings. So that list may change as we continue to work uh, towards the beginning of our school year. So do check back and um, get updates. Uh, Dr. Nichols, how will students submit homework? And will classroom work be completed on Chromebooks to cut down on the use of paper? Well, with every student receiving a Chromebook, um, we're going to teach all of our students on how to use our learning management system, uh, Canvas, in which students will have the opportunity which they can submit their work electronically through our Canvas system. And again, you know, whether you're in the hybrid or total 100% virtual, You'll have that opportunity to submit your work electronically. But again, if we have situations where somebody can't get uh, connected to the internet, we'll also have opportunities for students to provide hard copies of work to them and also will receive that work. But the one thing with our Canvas learning management system is that we'll have the ability to collect things digitally. So it would cut down on some paper, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, the next question regarding grades. How are you ensuring that grades truly reflect students' coursework and effort instead of students' adaptability to the virtual environment? Dr. Strike? So um, sort of, as I, as I think about that question that you're asking, it sort of has two parts to it. So adaptability to a virtual environment. Tom just men mentioned the importance of training and preparation ahead of time. So. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Kisner mentioned orientation for students and kicking things off like we do every year. If you can just imagine, your first week of school is that orientation towards what are the expectations um, for that engagement, for showing progress, and showing what I'm learning. And that's being planned um, in, in all of our uh, instructional design right now. And I think the other piece that's important to remember is um, if we were all in our classrooms face-to-face, -face, how do grades reflect the work 
in a face-to-face -face classroom. So it's a question that we continue to work on, um, and we need to con we really need to continue. How do we measure that in ways that are robust for the kids? So. Um, it's almost like a trick question, Dr. Greider, uh, for me right now, because that's something that we've had a lot of conversations on recently. So once again, uh, just to reiterate, so these are uh, parent questions, and we appreciate them. There's some really excellent questions Yes, here. they are. So, um, ah, Dr. Nichols, what about parent-teacher conferences? Will they be virtual? That's definitely a possibility, and I think it really depends on the health situation that we're in at the time. Uh, we're going to do everything we can to be flexible with families to ensure that they have the opportunity to meet with their teachers and that whether that may be a, a phone conference, whether it's a virtual Google Meet or Zoom Meet, or whether it's a face-to-face -face if that's what works at the time. But sure, we're going to ensure and we're going to make sure that our, our teachers are reaching out to our students and our families to make sure we keep that connection because that connection is really vital to the success of our students. So this next one is a little bit about scheduling, and so Ms. Neely, you talked about that earlier on. When and how will we know if we are 100% virtual Group A or Group B family? Can we switch from Group A or B to accommodate our family's needs, and can families change their mind as to which option they've selected? Right, lots of questions in, in one. <laughs> um, so we have been working, uh, Jay Cook has worked um, diligently with our technology folks to try to determine how to divide that A and B so that we can um, ad adhere to physical distancing in our schools and also um, make the um, accommodations that we need to in terms of roughly having half a class if we're working virtually with students. Um, so we developed this A-B schedule. Well, we quickly realized, I know I had a call from a couple of uh, elementary principals who said, oh, well, if I go, if I just divide from L, A to L, that works great for fourth grade, but it doesn't work at all for second grade. So we quickly learned that we were going to have to rethink that division a little bit. So Jay and his office um, were able to find a dividing point, but they did it by every grade level, I believe. Um, is that correct? which was very helpful as a starting point but really that's what it is is a starting point because we know we're going to have circumstances where uh, we have families who have a need for example to be in one group versus the other i can't guarantee that we can honor every single request because we do right. want to and need to balance that <clears throat> out um, but again, once we have um, the official word, if we're moving forward virtual or hybrid, um, as we open the school year, we will start moving. And I would say that once you find out whether your child is in A or B group, if there's, again, an, a situation and you need help from um, someone to work that out with you, contact your child's principal is probably the first stop there because they, um, they know the groupings in their school best. Um, but certainly we're, I hope that you're getting the message tonight in this very uncertain time. We want to be as flexible as we can to support uh, the needs of our community. Yes, and the families um, would be intact, um, and, and we hope that that helps your uh, schedule at home and your home life moving forward. So I know the one, one of the things that we've talked about this evening is the importance of um, being able to move from, from one schedule to another if, if we were required to do so. So Dr. Nichols, if you, if you did select a 100% virtual for the fall, how will students reintegrate back into the classroom in the spring should school return to normal or even still be hybrid? And then conversely, should the COVID situation cause another shutdown, will students and teachers be able to smoothly transition to virtual? That's a great question. I think that that's something we want to make sure that our families are really versed in is that the beauty of our hybrid and our 100% virtual option utilizing Canvas as our learning management system, it's a seamless transition. You can go in from hybrid, where you're face-to-face -face for two days and doing virtual learning the other three. If you need to go to the 100% um, 
virtually you'll be able to, to do that seamlessly because we're using the same curriculum. We're using Stafford County Public School teachers in our, in our classes. And even if you have to go back from the virtual back into a hybrid, it'll be seamless because it's the same content, the same curriculum. And if we, I think the biggest difference, if we went back and everybody said we're back to normal, we may change our times a little longer because kids will be in school five days a week, you know, for a regular day if that's eventually what will happen at some point. So uh, to answer that question, Dr. Greider, it's going to be very seamless. And that's the beauty of our setup now. All right, Ms. Neely, if you could take the next one. Are you going to reconsider opening the schools to full face-to-face -face interaction five days a week at some point during the school year if things are looking better? I think we all look forward to that day. Um, as um, Dr. Nichols was alluding to here, we are, we are anxiously awaiting the day when we can bring our students back uh, full time. We just unfortunately don't um, have the magic answer right now as to the when um, that will happen. As Dr. Kisner is, um, continues to remind us in his frequent newsletters home that this is a fluid, rapidly changing um, process that we're all a part of right now. Um, but we, we are in it together and we are looking forward to the win and we will be taking our direction from our data and certainly from the health professionals and, and guidance we receive uh, there, but no one is more anxious to welcome all of our students back than we are. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Nichols, this next question is about uh, how many students per classroom are you realistically expecting with the hybrid option? Well, as you know, with our hybrid option, we have a group A and a group B. And with the guidelines, we're dividing our classes up to 50%. So if you typically have in an elementary school maybe 22 students in a class, you'd have 11 in class on an A day or on an A group and then 11 in the B group for that class. If you're at a high school or a middle school, if a class is around 30 students, again, that'll be 50% where we'll have 15 students in a classroom, 15 in A group, and 15 in the B group. So we're splitting our schedules in half. Okay. Uh, the next question is related to both middle and high school uh, and student schedules, so I, I'll take that one. Um, so as you've heard about a group and B group, hybrid, 100% virtual. There's different scheduling configurations. And so um, because of that, our, our, uh, our staff, our principals, our assistant principals, our, our guidance counselors, and, and sometimes other members of their leadership teams work very hard to, are, are working very hard uh, to develop schedules so that we can ensure that we do have that seamless transition from one phase to another if it's needed and required. So obviously working furiously on schedules and trying to get those out to uh, parents, uh, families as soon as possible is always the goal. Uh, what we're looking at from a realistic standpoint is having schedules released probably the week prior to the beginning of school. And so uh, Dr. Nichols, if you could take the next question, uh, what checks will be in place to ensure that students are meeting the standards typically expected without the external influences of limited access to technology and the possibility of cheating. Right. Um, if you refer to our frequently asked questions website, you're going to find information there on students that may not have access to technology, and we've addressed that a little bit earlier today. But I think cheating means different things to different people and to our educators. And we're really going to try and focus on the learning. And, and we're going to work with our students at the beginning of the year, as we always do, to ensure that they follow the honor codes, to make sure they follow the acceptable use agreements with the technology. Also make sure that we discuss integrity and ownership and, and plagiarism and other things that, you know, that could be considered with cheating. But we're going to do a, a great job at working with our families, working with our students, focusing on the instruction. And there's a lot of different ways to assess students than just giving a paper test or having them, you know, do something electronically. There, there's a lot of ways that teachers can assess our students to give appropriate feedback to help them as they move forward in their instruction. And on the note of assessments, Dr. Nichols, 
what, what plan is in place for students to take SOLs, PSATs, and AP exams or other standardized tests for the 100% virtual model? All right. Um, with our state, as you know, our students, if they have an end of course test, an SOL, they're required to take that test. And in the past, we've done that in school utilizing online technology. And the reason that's given in school is because of the um, confidentiality of the tests and being the secure of our tests. This past spring, when COVID hit and our school shut down, um, we were given a waiver with our SOLs and uh, we're student, we could use a locally verified credit to award um, the verified credit for SOL courses. Uh, so we're currently waiting and pending VDOE um, recommendations and guidelines for the fall on what that will look like um, in regards to PSAT and AP testing and any other end of year testing. Um, again, we're waiting on the college board to provide feedback again in the spring. They provided a virtual testing opportunity for AP tests. Um, but right now they have not discussed what this coming year will look like. But I'm sure they will provide opportunities for students to uh, take those tests. More information to come. Yes, sir. All right. Um, and here's an interesting question, Ms. Neely. So why are the expectations or standards left to each individual school or teacher and not mandated by the superintendent? So this may be, you know, um, a, it sounds like it might be from a parent who is possibly frustrated about the spring experience virtually and, and maybe different students getting different things. One of the things that Dr. Kisner has asked us to do as we move forward into the fall is to create a rules of engagement document and so we've been working collaboratively um, as an instructional leadership team. We'll be sharing that out with principals and teachers as we develop it over the next several days. Uh, but it does give guidance for uh, our staff, for parents and students in terms of the expectations moving forward. We know we have to be very tight on that and we have to be very transparent in terms of our expectations for uh, monitoring student work for providing feedback um, and I will add that you know in addition to those uh, rules of engagement that we will move forward with um, and those are based on our overarching goals of what we want to see happen for students uh, by the way um, we know that um, in addition to having that document to help guide our works Canvas also has a great potential because we can monitor, uh, for example, the frequency that students participate in the Canvas course, um, the frequency that a teacher is participating with students and reaching back out to students. Uh, so again, I know that we've spent a good deal of time talking about the possibilities that Canvas is going to provide for us, but during this time, I do believe it is going to be a game changer for us. And in terms of the common expectations, I think that that is going to be loud and clear come fall. And Dr. Nichols, a, a question that comes up often with parents. Will students have communication with teachers, not just given a module and told to complete it? You know, this question it sort of piggybacks off Ms. Neely's question. Um, our expectations are that our teachers will be communicating with our students and our parents through our rules of engagement. Um, we also are going to ensure that with Canvas, we have the opportunity for students to checking in, um, taking attendance, and we're going to make sure that we have the engagement within our class. And I think the most important piece that we need to remember in this 100% virtual environment or hybrid is that our Stafford County Public Schools teachers are going to be instructing our students, whether it be a live um, video lesson or whether it be a recorded lesson, but we're also going to have a variety of other resources that we use. So I can't say that a module will never be used because there may be a situation that a teacher utilizes one of those content resources. Again, going back to our kitchen, there's a lot of other appliances in that kitchen that we can use. Um, so they may have one lesson in a module, but no, they're not going to be um, 
signing up for a course where it's all directed through the computer. They'll be interacting with our teachers. Teachers will be reaching out to family, students, and communicating because we know that those connections are so important to the success of our students. And students interacting with students, too. Absolutely. Through our Google uh, Classroom. Yep. Ms. Neely, can you take our last question? Wow, it's the last one. If SCPS decides to go to a virtual-only option for everyone, like some of the surrounding districts, will the assignments be teacher-specific or grade-specific? So I'm going to quote a question from Dr. Strike a couple of weeks ago. Uh, she asked the question, has something good come out of COVID for you? She asked our instructional team that question. And I really started thinking about that. Um, I think about that in regard to this question because our expectation is teachers are going to be planning and, and really it's going to be essential that they plan together as a strong professional learning community to get this work done at the level of quality that we're expecting and we are really demanding for our students because it is, it's just essential moving forward. But it's a great um, opportunity for teachers who maybe haven't experienced the power of that to experience the power of working with an incredible team because we know we're stronger when we plan together. I know our team is stronger when we plan together. Um, and so I'm really excited for teachers to be given the opportunity to plan this way. I think that when folks you know, question well, why couldn't we have, you know, just five hours of learning every single day for every child? One thing we know, we piloted in elementary school this summer, uh, a summer school pilot um, with teams planning this way. And we got a lot of great feedback in terms of the plans. We still had some learning to do in terms of the rules of engagement, for example, or our connectivity, but what we realized is when you bring a team of talented professionals together, um, incredible learning happens. So I'm hoping that uh, those tight PLCs, um, you know, many of us are, you know, have our, our work friend community, you know, that is really important to us right now. And so we hope that those relationships continue to grow and benefit our students. Um, so teams of professional learning communities, that might be a fifth grade team, it might be a, mm -hmm. a science department yep. at the high school level, um, but this is gonna encourage a practice that we already know is good for kids. We have countless examples of schools who have honed in on the expectations for their professional learning community and have seen incredible academic success doing that. Um, and, and there's just a lot of joy in doing it uh, when it's done the right way. So I'm looking forward to seeing what happens there. Thank you. And Dr. Grad, I'd just add that we, we made sure that in our models, we've put in time for our teachers to plan together to develop curriculum to make it seamless. I, my, my final comments would, um, if they are the final comments um, this evening, I, I can't thank Dr. Kisner and our school board enough um, when they gave us the three weeks because the power of adults working together um, to, to make things happen for kids that are high quality um, is is happening right now. It, it was happening during the summer, but with that earlier start date, with the resources that we wanted to put together, with the timeline to allow Jay and his team, um, Mr. Cook and his team, um, g get Canvas up and going, um, I can't I can't thank the folks um, enough for giving those giving us those three Absolutely. weeks. I I also can't thank our teachers enough because. They have been out there behind the scenes working with our facilitators in LAUD at planning um, and getting ready to learn in our Canvas. So um, we're really, I'm actually very excited about it. And I think we'll be a better organization when we get through this together. Agree. All right. Absolutely. I'd like to thank the members of our panel. I'd also like to thank the parents for taking the time to, to write in the questions. They were excellent questions. And so we certainly appreciate that.
So that takes us to the end, Dr. Kisner. Okay. Um, I do want to um, greatly thank the four of you. Um, last night, you were done at 11 o'clock. You worked 15 hour days, 16 hour days. Today, you started at least by seven because I was talking to you. So um, I want to thank you and I want to thank your, your spouses and children. Um, you do exist. Um, so I also uh, absolutely want to thank the community. We are asking you to take a journey with us. Um, COVID-19 is why we have this journey. I know there's a lot of people have strong feelings about how we should start, when we should start. Um, I have made it clear as superintendent. Um, I have a responsibility to maximize the safety of our children and our staff. And as Dr. Strike said, um, I have great confidence that we're actually going to be a better school system than we've ever been, a lot because of people uh, front and behind me and the 4,000 employees we have, but also the thousands of parents that have shared their thoughts. We're trying to have these town hall meetings to be um, hopefully informative, but transparent, and to recognize that it is a journey, that we're better than we were when we had to close on March 12th with basically no notice and basically had to put together some continuity of learning plan. I thank greatly the teachers and others. I got an email today that I shared with Ms. Neely of elementary teachers who said, let me share with the public, let me share with the school board the work we've been doing. I think people will be very impressed. The can-do attitude is what we need. I know I get emails and people, you know, let me, they feel comfortable sharing with me their thoughts and, and I appreciate those that, uh, I appreciate them all, but I, I appreciate those that um, have a thought with a suggestion. Uh, I think that's uh, an opinion with a suggestion helps us rethink our direction. And, and one of the examples would be just a month ago, we were talking about a, 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 a program in a sense, K-12 Inc that would not have had our teachers be your child's primary teacher. And the feedback from parents and the school board was, is there another way of doing it? Is there a better way of doing it? And the extra three weeks and the great staff that we have here and the great staff that are not here tonight, um, I think we found a, a, a much better way. And so um, we don't have all the answers. Uh, we have um, a desire and a passion to do it right. And um, I will tell you this, on August 31st, uh, whatever we roll out will be really good, but it won't be perfect. And in a couple of weeks after that, it will be better than it was on August 31st, and a couple of weeks after that, it will be, keep on getting better. But that's even true when your child's at school in a regular schedule. You're just not as aware of that. So I do thank you. I will tell you we will have additional town halls uh, meetings. This is a face shield. Um, I share that with you because one of our town halls that we will have um, in a few weeks will focus on our health mitigation strategies. And um, Colette uh, will have a panel of um, uh, health providers that we could share what we are doing at our schools. I will tell you that we are creating videos um, uh, they're already actually um, being developed where some of our schools are um, making sure if you look at it, if you go into a subdivision that's new and you go into a model home, um, it always looks like really perfect. Um, so we're having a couple schools that are going to uh, share with the public what it will be when our children return to Stafford schools and our staff return. So you will see those videos. Um, we will also have one, we receive a lot of questions pertaining to children with disabilities. And um, I think it's, it warrants to have um, Dr. Hummer and some members of his staff to um, have a specific town hall um, to, so we could um, address the questions um, from parents with children with disabilities. And what was earlier stated, I, um, 
every school, uh, we had a principal's meeting today and uh, it was stated, it was a comment made by a school board member last night and a terrific idea that um, who knows your children the best? It's your principals, your teachers, your school counselors, nurses, and so on. So we will, um, before school starts, uh, you will be receiving, I'm sure you're already receiving, but you'll be receiving many uh, different correspondents welcoming you and also sharing an opportunity where your principal will uh, lead a discussion so people could better understand what's going to happen on August 31st. Which I do remind you that today's only July 22nd. And this COVID-19 has kind of altered our thinking of summer. Um, and, you know, it, we, um, we recognize it's 90 degrees out, 100 degrees out. But if we didn't have that, many of us um, and many of you listening um, didn't really get to appreciate the summer that you have had in the past. I will also encourage you greatly because we receive many, many questions daily. And every Friday letter, I link you to our frequently asked questions, FAQ. And I would highly encourage you to, we try to update it twice a week. Um, and so I would uh, again encourage you to go on our website. It's easy to navigate, find that page that says uh, frequently asked questions or FAQ and your question that you have may have the answer up there. If not, um, submit it. Um, just understand that we most likely um, will answer it on the FAQ page. I know myself and everybody up here have called parents. Um, so sometimes the question has a sense of urgency and we want to be as customer friendly as possible. I have, uh, even today with Dr. Hummer, um, uh, have had uh, Zoom chats and phone calls with parents so we could be, again, as accommodating as possible. But I think everybody understands we do have 30,000 children. And so we, um, you know, we have to uh, manage the time in a way that meets everyone's needs. So um, tonight's presentation, if you um, didn't catch the whole thing, or you talked to a neighbor or a friend and said, I didn't know about it, um, we'll be on the website probably um, very soon this evening, but definitely by tomorrow morning. Um, we have a YouTube channel, so you guys are on YouTube for life now. Um, so, um, and um, again, it's a journey. I thank everybody for being on this journey with us, um, but I, I remind us all uh, the reason we're here, the reason we're doing this is because the uncertainty of, uh, of a COVID-19 virus that um, is, not, um, uh, is not going away, um, unfortunately. And we are taking the steps necessary uh, to reduce the spread and the chances that your child and our staff and anyone that gets con in contact with our schools um, trying to minimize the chances that somebody will get ill. So again, I thank you and everyone enjoy your night.